Well, welcome to another episode of AY After Hours. Um, today we're going to talk about government spending in the water industry, and we're fortunate enough to have a couple of guests with us from, um, first of all, it's Greg Vells, and Greg is the Vice President of Strategic Sourcing with Fortaline Waterworks. And we also have Zach Perconti, and Zach is the principal at Government Affairs Solution out of Washington, D.C. And so, you know, just to kind of kick it off real quick, um, you know, Greg, just give us a little bit of your work background. I and mean, you've been a you've been a guest before, but if you can give us just a little bit of a background um, as far as your work experience, and then and then Zach, yours as well. After that, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm, right now I'm in the vice president of sourcing at Fort Lyon Waterworks. I've been in that job since about 2014. Um, I actually started a company back in 2002 with a couple other members in Florida. Uh, I've been in the water sewer industry for 44 years. So uh, I, I started, I actually found this job as a high school job and back when in Winter Park, Florida, where I was working on the utility department during a summer job in high school and become fascinated with what's going on in the water industry. Because, uh, you know, at that time I was just a high school kid, didn't really know much about anything. I thought government just gave everybody water and sewer and all the other things. And I realized, no, there's actually an industry out there. So I kind of went that direction when I went into college and I actually chose this career. Uh, so when I came out, I entered a water and sewer distributors, uh, when I got out of college and then been in that ever since. And this is a job that I've uh, really enjoyed, uh, very passionate about because, um, a lot of people don't understand how important water and sewer needs are and storm needs for us as the United States. Um, it definitely separates us from the rest of the world because um, we do have the best systems that are out there, um, but we do need to work on what we have because it is starting to deteriorate, deteriorate at a very quick pace, which is really a problem we have. So uh, I've been very passionate about this. And as I've told all my friends, uh, you know, that know what I do for a living, we, we you know, as WASDA, as members of uh, different distributors, we are the stewards of water. We need to get out there and spread the word to everybody about our water infrastructure needs and the problems that we have out there. I mean, most people see this on news media; they see the lead problems, they see different things. Uh, they just don't understand the scope of the work, and that's why we, as an organization, go to Washington and, and speak to our legislation members about the needs and trying to get the funding we need to get it down in the state levels where it really helps every individual that's on this podcast or listening to this podcast because it's very important. So I've been doing this all my life. And so uh, when it comes to water, uh, my family knows me as the water guy, um, but uh, uh, it's, I'm, I really love just this industry and just being a part of it because it is good for America. Yeah, before we jump to Zach, we talked previously and we're laughing like, oh, my gosh, how are we going to keep this podcast with Greg to like under three hours? Yeah. Because there's so much passion and there's so much history and knowledge. So you are absolutely the two of you are the perfect guests for this topic to kind of educate us and enlighten us. So, Zach, how about you? Well, I was going to say, um, yeah, you've got two folks in here who certainly like to talk lots about water. So hopefully we don't give you too much content to sort through. Um, thank you all for having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Zach Perkani. Uh, I am a principal at Government Affairs Solutions, which is a relatively young government affairs firm uh, that mostly specializes in uh, representing associations that are active in the utilities construction space. And for me, my background and expertise uh, really in particular has to do a lot with underground infrastructure and especially water infrastructure. I've been working on water infrastructure issues now since 2019. Um, before that, I was wrapping up my master's in public policy um, at uh, George Mason University at the Char School of Policy and Government. Uh, and I've been working in and around this industry in the transportation and infrastructure world um, since 2016 in a number of different roles. So this is my career. This is what I'm passionate about as well. You know, just like Greg, um, I've spent my entire time in the policy world really focused on these pressing issues uh, of America's, frankly, failing infrastructure. Um, we've seen in, in my time uh, some tremendous progress. 
I'm very excited uh, to talk about what's happening with the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, it was a lot of work getting that bill across the finish line, and we're poised to reap a lot of the benefits from that over the next few years. Um, but of course, there's still tremendous challenges. Um, there are issues with implementation, uh, and then no shortage of more work to be done. Um, you know, we're facing really uh, only the first steps in what's going to be a, a many year journey to undo, frankly, decades of neglect. Um, and so it's an exciting time to be in this industry, um, but it's one that's going to require a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication to, to make sure we don't backslide. So for anybody listening, I feel like the word infrastructure is just thrown around there all the time. And for anybody that maybe doesn't have like of just a very basic understanding of like what we are talking about, lay that out for somebody listening. When you say water infrastructure, what are we talking about? Sure. So this is actually something that I find really frustrating working in Washington, D.C. Um, when the average person inside the Beltway talks about infrastructure, what they're talking about is roads and bridges, things you can see. And in fact, during the debate over the bipartisan infrastructure law, I remember one representative getting on television and saying, well, there's so much in this bill that's not really infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of money in here that's going to things like pipes. And for me, working in the water infrastructure space, you know, I was immediately shouting at the television because when I think about infrastructure, pipes are one of the first things I think about. I think about the water and sewer lines that are underneath our streets and in our homes. I think about the waterworks facilities that are providing clean drinking water and treating wastewater. I think about our storm drain systems um, that both control flooding as well as you know, take rainwater and move that out to sea. I think about all of the various aspects of the water cycle from you know, precipitation to in the home to in the treatment plant and back around again. Right. So all of these elements from a very basic perspective are what we're talking about when we're talking about water infrastructure. But here's where I like to turn it over to folks like Greg, who can really give you a lot of the, the more of the specifics of what actually happens at every different part of the water infrastructure world. Hit us with it, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> Rob McDonald and I sat in a meeting and Rob explained it very well to our, his congressman uh, in that area is that everybody sees bridges, they see road construction, they see all this stuff, but it's what's underneath the ground that you don't see really creates the biggest problem we have because that is the water mains, the sewer mains, the store mains, which really keeps America flowing. And when you think about that, um, the average Americans, we use about 42 basically billion gallons of water a day, a day. And that includes factories, drinking water, all that stuff. So without a good supply of that, we're basically shut down. And, and water, as we know, is the life of everything. Uh, it's the only reason we can be the, what we are as being a great country is because the water source we have, the quality of water we have, the supply of water we have. I mean, you look at third world countries and they have to go and try to find water every day. It's a daily part of our lives. We just take it for granted. We turn on the tap, the water's going to be coming there. And when we, the rains come, the, the rain runoff runs down the sewer mains and storm mains and all the other things. So, the bottom line is that we've been blessed in that, and, but people don't pay attention to that because there was a cartoon in, in the New York Times years ago where it had showed all the water mains above the sidewalks where people were walking there and basically it was dripping and leaking and they're all sitting there going, and basically the caption said, would you walk under this? And that's how bad this really is underneath the ground, but no one pays attention to it. You know, when you talk about losing 6.4 billion gallons of water a day is what the loss is. That's huge. That equals about 2.2 trillion gallons a year. And wow. there's where we're having a real problem because everybody sees the news and the water main breaks. But really, in the United States right now, there's an estimated main break every two minutes. And there's over 300,000 water main breaks a year at this point in time. So we're really at a point of a pinnacle point of a crisis, really, where we got to really look at the, what's below ground that takes care of us above ground. And uh, when you think about water mains and problems you know if you go by hospitals you go by all these places they have all these power generators in case they lose power but none of those places have anything for water backup reserves they don't have water storage tanks they don't have those type of uh, uh, containers to be able to keep going and then when the water main breaks that means your fire goes down your fire protection means all your water mains your sewer mains all that stuff stops working and it's a real problem and like i said at this point in time 
we need to make sure that everybody's more aware of what's below ground they're walking on. They just take for granted. Cause like I said, out of sight, out of mind. And that's how we've been working at this so far. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's funny because that, that cartoon that Greg mentioned is something that we talk about all the time in DC. We like to say Congress would fix this problem the next day. If just for one day, you yeah. took all of the water lines in the Capitol complex and you put them above ground. <laughs> and yeah, expose it. <laughs> you know, it's worth noting. Um, we remind folks on the Hill all the time. There were lead drinking water lines in use in some of the house buildings as early uh, or as recently as uh, 2016. So right. this is a problem that affects them every single day as well. But they don't see it the same way that you can see when there's a pothole in the road or when the power goes out or when a bridge is rusting apart, right? It only becomes apparent at the point of failure. And that's something that Congress constantly has to be reminded about. And when you talk about the lead, lead lines like Zach just talking about, think about this. Ronald Reagan ba ba banned lead in 1987. So it wasn't that long ago they were still making lead pipes, lead goosenecks, lead to basically carry water supply. It's a roughly estimate right now there's 12 million leaded pipelines leading to almost 22 million people in the United States right now still active out there. And that's why this lead replacement is such a big deal. The amount of money they gave us, the $15 billion to start working on, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what the real costs are going to be. Because the real estimated costs are somewhere between $55 billion to $65 billion to get this repaired. And we're still drinking all those, but yet we can't have leaded paint. We can't have all these other things, but yet we can drink all these water lines that are lead fed. And they don't have to be all lead. It could be just the goosenecks on the main, but there is lead there. And it's a big problem that no one looks at and no one wants to talk about because... The government started speaking about it and said, well, we're going to fix this. Well, they've opened Pandora's box and they got a real problem in their hands because they're way under the estimates they need to get this done. And just to clarify, so we don't create like mass panic, the lead, because we did a we did um, an episode on lead once and it isn't necessarily the lead. It's when the lead is disturbed and the lining that creates a barrier between the lead and the drinking water. But if we have aging infrastructure, yeah. it obviously needs to be disturbed because things need to be fixed. So that's where it really becomes like a snowball rolling down right. a hill. Right. And I know this is a because every time you have a line break, you have a disturbance. Right. And it sends a shock wave through the main system and either from the break, but when they put the lines back in the service again after the repairs, and I'm with you. I don't need to send an alarming message to everybody in the United States that we got a real situation with the lead pipes, but we do. And like yeah. I said, when you talk about ground movement, that's a normal fact. That's why they created goosenecks to go from the mains to actually your service line to give you that flexibility because they're all of a sudden the earth is shifting all the time. So there is movement in there and we need to address that and we need the funding to continue going and we don't need to be cut at this point in time. Yeah. Right. And, and that's the drum that I always have to beat on Capitol Hill is, you know, even with the investment from the bipartisan infrastructure law, from other federal programs, uh, it's not enough. I mean, even if you use the government's own numbers just on lead alone, it's going to require forty two and a half billion at a minimum to replace what they've estimated as of their last drinking water infrastructure needs survey and assessment. So we are at least thirty billion dollars short for lead pipe replacement alone. And we're not even getting into other drinking water needs. We're not getting into stormwater needs. We're not getting into wastewater needs. If you take the numbers that are out there across all three of those fields, over the next 20 years, the necessary investment is north of $1 trillion. And that's just to maintain current expected levels of service. So we're not really making a whole lot of progress here. And that's that's really the big challenge, right? Because when you talk to Congress about this legislation and about the work that's being done in this industry, well, they want to point to the bipartisan infrastructure law as this great step forward. And it is. We're making progress here. But that bill is $55 billion of investment across all water needs. And if you look at the five-year increase in need from the last time they did the drinking water need survey and this one that just came out, in those last five years, drinking water estimated needs rose by over $130 billion by themselves. So we're making some progress, but really all we're doing here is slowing the decline. In order to truly invest, truly make up the needs 
that this country has in water infrastructure, Congress and the administration are going to need to go a lot further. And unfortunately, like Greg said, right now, the challenge we're having in D.C. isn't getting them to invest that extra money. It's convincing them not to cut what we already have. Correct. Okay. Right. Well, and, and I'd also assume that when you're looking at this from a you know, from investing in in the water infrastructure, there's also additional economic benefits that go along with that 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 people don't even see or know about. What what what? Can you give me some examples of those or or what that's all about? There's, I mean, there would be a tremendous benefit, right? Uh, this is something that is the bedrock of our society. Everybody needs water. Every business in this country needs water. And according to to some previous studies that groups have done, uh, if we were to fully meet that trillion dollar investment needs, then by 2039 or so, uh, US GDP would grow by about four and a half trillion dollars. So every dollar you invest into water infrastructure is substantially returned to the economy. This is one of the best investments the federal government can make. The challenge is it's a lot of money that we need. And, and just getting them to put this money into the market is the struggle. Once you've done that, though, society is going to see tremendous benefits. That's not to mention that for every uh, every billion dollars that you invest in water infrastructure, you create well over 20,000 jobs. Um, we're, we're delivering on uh, a domestic manufacturing commitment that this administration has made. Um, there's a lot to talk, I know, about things like the Buy America rules. Those are here to stay in order to make sure that th that implementation is successful, there needs to be the market support for that long term. Um, so there are lots of reasons why it makes sense from an economic perspective to put this money in. So it makes sense on paper. Is the struggle the fact? If it, Does it just kind of always circle back to the fact that it's the unseen? Think about it. When does water infrastructure make the news? Well, it'll make local news if a water main breaks. But when was the last time we had a national news story that really kept water in the cycle? It was Flint, Michigan. And most of the Flint conversation didn't really, unfortunately, I think from our perspective, get into a lot of the root causes of what was happening. We looked a lot about who's to blame. We're mm -hmm. seeing this again now in Jackson, Mississippi. We haven't really gotten a lot into the root causes of what happened there. We're, we're looking mostly to cast about blame. The thing is, there are hundreds of towns all across the United States that are Flint's or Jackson's just waiting to happen. But that's not going to make the news until we've hit that point of catastrophic failure. Our right. job in Washington is to try to avoid hitting that point of catastrophic failure. Yeah, I think the last big national water main break was in 2014 when it broke out in California and flooded Berkeley and flooded and they couldn't shut the mains off for basically two days, um, that made national news. Those lines were put in 1932. It was a 30 inch line and the other line was a 36 inch line. It was put in 1928 that broke and the mains could not be shut off because they couldn't locate the valve. So the amount of gallons of water that lost out there was unbelievable enough that it flooded the garages and the whole area out there and washed away the big parts of the road and streets. But that kind of news got national news. That's coming very soon because most of our mains in the United States are basically getting over 100 years old. And their life expectancy at that time was maybe 25 to 30 years of life expectancy. And they're already still pushing 100 years old now. So probably by 2030, almost a third of the water mains in the United States will be over 100 years old. And we're talking about major metropolis areas that have been around for a lot of years. So those type of breaks are going to start showing up on the news more and more often. And you just can't recover from those type of water losses and the amount of destruction it does. Because when you're talking about a 30 inch and a 36 inch main, you're talking about erosion of roads, curbs, parking lots, buildings, whatever it may be, uh, could create real problems for us. And we all know California's got a surplus of water. So uh, that alone is just a, a point of self to think about. But those are going to start happening more and more often. And like I said, that's part of that 300 you know, basically 300,000 mains breaking a year, but there are going to be a large diameter going to start popping. We just had one recently in uh, South Carolina, less than three years ago at a water uh, storage facility there at a water treatment plant. They had to end up draining two uh, 20 million gallons of water they lost because the line was put in in 1926. It was a 20, 
inch line right there outside of Port Mill. Uh, so, like I said, these type of mains are going to start happening, and these breaks are going to start happening constantly, and, and it's only going to start getting worse because of the age of the infrastructure. So that's why we're here to make you know people aware of it. I'm not trying to paint a, a dark story, but when you talk about what's the, the investment – into what it's going to cost as well. Right now, it costs you this, but in 25 years from now, it's going to cost you way more than that. And if we're talking about bringing more jobs to the United States, more factories coming to the United States, our population's growing, our water usage uh, needs are increasing greatly. Um, and we just need to really look at what we're doing here because we have the best water in the world. We have the safest water in the world. And we really, that separates us from third world countries, let's face it. And that's why we have to have a great water source of clean and safety. So there's a lot of issues behind this thing. And we just need to make people aware of it, how, how important it is to understand that. And it comes back to the individual users, you know, users just at home. Think about this. You run your water, you turn around, you go to the sink, you leave it running, you walk away, you come back to you, you go and walk away. Three or four trips you made, you can turn the faucet off, but we just let it keep running. That water is going to become very precious here in the future because there is some estimates in 2050 that the United States, if we don't start working on our water usage, is going to be in a water shortage, and that's going to affect this whole country. I want to talk about the the, the end user real quick because I think that's really important. Everybody knows that water is essential. Everybody knows um, that water is a, a critical utility. I mean, most folks in the United States, when they buy a home, they don't want to buy a house that doesn't have running water, right? But when we look at our water bills, I think a lot of folks kind of take for granted what we pay. Um, it is not nearly as high as it could be. And that is going to change if we don't take action in D.C., I mean, there are growing costs that these systems have to shoulder, both from aging and failing infrastructure that when it breaks has to be fixed. It's not like you have the luxury of just ignoring it. Um, it's when it when it happens, it's an emergency. Right. And because, as Greg said, we, we have some of the, the best and, and strongest water safety regulations in the in the entire world. The costs of compliance with those regulations are mounting. I mean, there are. Uh, big pushes coming out from Washington, D.C. and from state governments right now to address contaminants like PFAS in the water system. And that costs money. So between increased costs of compliance and failing systems, a lot of water systems are going to be forced very soon to make the hard choice of how high can we raise our rates right. Right, without unduly burdening the public. And after a certain point, that question of undue burden isn't really one they can afford to ask anymore. There are, according to a number of different industry surveys that I've seen, less than 20% of municipal systems across the country that feel that they can adequately shoulder these increased costs just through rates and fees alone. So if we don't take action, water very quickly could become something that is unaffordable for the average American. And that's not a society that is set up for success. Woo! So much information to share about government spending and the waterworks industry. Two amazing guests. We're going to have to wrap up part one. Um, so much good content, but stay tuned because part two will be out soon. 